Thank you so much for joining us here today. This event, the times they are changing, how the pandemic changed education at Cambridge. With me here today are Tim Wheel and remotely joining in Dee Scadden. My name is Matthias Landgraf. The title refers to a Bob Dylan song which became an anthem for change in the 1960s, a turbulent time. And now, nearly 60 years on, we are here again in another turbulent time, a time of change. Now, while this time has been challenging, it has also been a gift uh, because it presents us with opportunities for change. For one, it has shown us that dramatic change at a wide scale is possible if only we put our minds to it. And secondly, it's shown us the importance and indeed maybe the sort of value and pleasure of working together collaboratively to find solutions. The three of us here are part of a much larger team at the School of the Biological Sciences working to sh shape strategy. And the activities that we'd like to present today are such as some aspects of the vision and pros uh, projects that we've been working on. And they reflect to an extent and maybe also influence some of the wider activities within the university. So over the next 25 to 30 minutes, we'll present a few snippets of what we've been up to, and then there'll be time for questions and discussion afterwards. Tim will start us off with undergraduate teaching. Wonderful, and thank you, Matthias, and to the organizers and to all of you uh, for joining us today. As you can imagine, things were relatively challenging about 18 months ago when we suddenly had to take all of the wonderful things we do, both in the lecture theater and in the practical setting, and move those online. And there were a lot of sort of dynamic times throughout the pandemic uh, that we've been dealing with. Uh, just to highlight a few of them, uh, we had to then move all of our examinations online. We had to come up with a way of actually assessing students both formatively and summatively. We had to then come up with new ways of running practicals, new ways of giving lectures, running Q&A sessions, having everyone able to have small group teaching, moving supervisions uh, to an online setting or to an outdoor setting. And all of these things, as Matthias just laid out, gave us a great opportunity and also made us all realize, and I think it was probably one of the first times, at least in my time here, uh, in the eight years I've been at Cambridge, where I saw everyone coming together, willing to work together to actually move forward in a relatively short period of time. And that was really the key, because I think for all of us looking strategically at what we do, we know things will be changing quite dramatically, not only in the past 18 months, but now uh, for the next five to 10 years. Education is uh, changing. And this is really bringing us now to the opportunities that we have. Uh, and this first off goes to then how we're thinking about restructuring the curriculum. And just to highlight why this is being explored now, for about 40 years now, the natural sciences has been run as a tripos. As many of you are, may be familiar with, it's the largest tripos at the university. It also has the physicists, so the School of Physical Sciences, as well as chemistry, geography, earth sciences, materials, biology, um, and many other uh, disciplines, all fitting under that one uh, large tripos. What we realize in the biological natural sciences is, things haven't really progressed with the rapid change that has taken place within our discipline. And so we've taken an opportunity now to look at what we're teaching, see if it's still fit for purpose for the students, and then move forward looking potentially to tweak different aspects or more dramatic changes if it's seen fit. So there is no necessarily a problem, or there is not necessarily a problem with the current system. It's still a wonderful opportunity to students to start broad, narrow into a subject that they love, that they're passionate about, spend some time doing research there, and then go off into the wide world to explore what they find to be most interesting about their career. Um, however, I think some of the feedback we've heard from students conti continually is not only about the workload, but also about trying to manage uh, choosing a course and deciding what they think is best within their sort of first two years. And that specifically goes to the second year. So in 1B, students are having to choose three courses. And what we realized is we were really forcing them into relatively narrow spaces. So what we've done is we've put together a pretty large group and we've put together an organization to now look at what we're doing and consider the restructure. So these are broken roughly into th the four different working groups. So the first working group is course content. So this is a group that we're going to specifically look at what we're teaching. 
And we're trying to go from less sort of pigeonhole, small little hobby horses of topics and actually make these slightly larger so that the students get exposed to more. So for example, and maybe a student would never come across certain mathematical concepts, or maybe they're never gonna think about animal biology or ecology or plant sciences if they took certain courses. And what we're trying to do now is actually integrate uh, into uh, six to seven courses more of the topics that we know and we find fascinating about the biological sciences. The second group is looking at assessment. And the days of walking into a lecture theater or into the sports hall with hundreds of desks laid out and a clock at the front and someone wandering around as you hand write uh, essays for three hours, um, which many of you may recall as being some of the more stressful times in your lives. Um, I was not brought up in this system and, and never had that experience, although um, we had some other things in the States that uh, I would dare say were equally as stressful. Um, but what we found is uh, exam halls may not be the future. And the pandemic has given us this great opportunity moving things online and taking advantage of the online uh, system. Not only for students to take exams remotely, but also um, we're much better about typing the exams, uh, which then means many of us can read what's been written. Uh, we also have uh, the ability for them to run different types of assessment through an online platform. And if we have time later, or if you're interested, we are exploring using digital platforms for this upcoming year um, for natural sciences in the biological side for the first two years, which we think is a real opportunity um, to move us forward and to pilot and test whether or not this is a viable way to examine students in the future. Now the fourth group is looking at management. And this is course management, not only for the individual courses, but also across the entire uh, tripos for each of the different year groups. But again, in the first two years, we'd love to see some consistency across the board. Um, what's happened over the decades is individuals have kind of come up with ways of solving problems, ways of doing certain things, and those get passed down within a course, but there is a lack of sort of communication across the courses. And so by bringing people together who are teaching on all of these different courses in uh, biological and natural sciences, we're now able to, to get some best practice, maybe from physiology. And then we'll hear what's been worked really well in pathology. And we'll be able to integrate this into a course management and a structure that'll be best for the students. And then finally, we're looking at delivery. And so how do we deliver uh, the content? So the classic way of standing up in front of a group of students and talking at them for 50 minutes um, is still a successful way to pass information on, but we're starting to explore other ways because more we learn about how students um, are able to pick up information, we know that diversity within the way we deliver will actually benefit all students. And so we've um, not only looked at small group teaching beyond the supervisions, things like a journal club where you'd read a paper and you'd consider what's in that paper and you'd have a group discussion of say 10 to 15 students. Things like giving presentations or designing a, a, a way of, of designing experiments to think about that sort of cutting edge of research. Um, all of these are ways that we think it'd be great to deliver the content. And then the flip side of that is our practicals, while fascinating and interesting, um, are many of them are, are kind of going through a change where they're being updated uh, with what we now know. So um, Matthias and I, for example, started using uh, a different way of, of, of assaying and we're using uh, newer equipment and more modern techniques. Um, and that's a really powerful way to give the students the chance to see what it's like on the front lines of biology. And we found actually, I think, the student feedback is almost always positive when you're making it uh, feel very recent and feel very modern. And also give them data, an opportunity to gather their own data, to think about that data, and in some cases even publish that data from projects that they're doing um, as undergraduates. That's a really important step to sort of getting them hooked uh, on why research is so exciting. So the, this is sort of the loose structure. There's then a steering committee for each of these four working groups. Um, from that point then, we're looking to hopefully bring online uh, any of the changes in the second year and potentially even in the first year in about three years time. So it takes time to build these in, but we're hoping by sort of 2024, 23, 24, or 24, 25, we'd be able to uh, launch what would be a, a slight shift in sort of how we view what's happening those first two years of natural sciences on the biological side. And we're very excited about this. There's been a ton of buy-in, and that goes back to what's happened in the pandemic again, uh, as Matthias mentioned. People are now realizing that by coming together and communicating, by, by working uh, in small groups, 
to come up and solving problems, that we can actually make really rapid progress that is well thought out, that is, that is reasonable and logical um, without having to go through and, and take sort of the years or even decades um, that have previously been the case. Um, so altogether, I would foresee us really taking advantage of the pandemic and what's happened there to bring in more digital learning, to have new ways of assessing students, new ways of thinking about how we deliver this material, integrating both online and in-person teaching, and diversifying um, what we're able to express to students and the way we teach it. And so with that, I will actually hand it over to Dee now to, to further elaborate on some of the new e-technologies that we're developing. Thanks, Tim. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about this. It's been a difficult time, but it's also been a very exciting time in terms of um, changing the way we teach and using more kind of technologically advanced methods. So as um, both Matthias and Tim have said earlier on, you know, the most obvious thing that we've had to deliver online are lectures. And this is something that prior to the pandemic, we're fortunate that we were actually in a situation where we were piloting so-called lecture capture um, platforms where um, lectures were being recorded, but this was during a more conventional lecture in a lecture space. So I think it's safe to say that during the past 18 months, it's been a massively steep learning curve for many of our colleagues going from showing up in a lecture theater and delivering a 50 minute lecture to somehow conveying the same enthusiasm and excitement online. But I would say that this has been achieved you know, admirably by our colleagues. There have been lots of technical kind of issues getting up and running, but it has been an exciting time. And I think we're now in a place where people are more comfortable with delivering things online, seeing themselves online, where the lecture experience is a little bit different to what it's been conventionally. Now, one of the biggest challenges in the last um, 18 months is not just delivering lectures, but it's delivering more practical teaching online. So of course, as scientists, we teach practical classes. It's a very practical hands-on subject. And we wanted to be able to get students into the lab. We've been able to do that a little bit during the pandemic. But what it's meant is we've had to develop lots of resources, lots of tools to be able to deliver online teaching. Now, as Tim said a moment ago, there's been lots of communication across the school, but different departments have adopted slightly different ways of delivering teaching. And what this has meant is that we can also draw from this experience a kind of um, best practice and best ways of doing things. In my own department, we were able to facilitate very interactive practicals online using uh, tools called Articulate 360. And we've learned how to deliver content to students where they can get the experience of being in the lab without actually being in the lab. You know, we've set up interactive practicals where there's opportunity to fail the practical if you make the wrong decisions. So it's very much decision-based practicals, but delivered virtually. And what we've had to do to kind of do this successfully is to make a really concerted effort to meet with students using Zoom or online. And the Zoom students have really engaged with this. And I think, you know, one of the biggest things for students is the lack of social kind of interaction and communication. So being able to have these Zoom sessions with students where you might go along in a very structured way or informal way has been something that we've had to embrace, but it's been quite positive. And of course, different students learn in different ways. So actually for the student who's not comfortable perhaps putting their hand up and asking a question, being able to ask it in the chat and having their question answered, and uh, you know, it's been a real benefit to them. And of course, other people who are in the session. Now, Tim mentioned a minute ago that one of the things um, that has been a change in the last 18 months is how we've delivered exams. I think, uh, unilaterally, people are very, very pleased not to be having to read handwritten scripts. So this has been a massive departure from what the more conventional exams has been like. And this has been, again, a steep learning curve. I think some of our colleagues have embraced this very well. Some of them have been quite frightened by the change, but they have kind of jumped on the learning curve and ended up in the right place. But overall, what this has done for us 
it's given us the opportunity to make changes, changes that were a bit overdue in some cases, um, but COVID has facilitated the change in ways that have naturally meant that people have had to get on board and had to kind of embrace things that they have been fearful of in some respects. So in terms of going forward with this, the innovation that's been taken place during COVID will just be the starting point for building on this. And I think what has happened is the communication that's been established across departments in the school, the trust that's been built with people delivering this sort of thing is really key and will underpin kind of what happens going forward. Now, a lot of the stuff that's been introduced has relied on some level of technological expertise that might not be by the lecturer, it might not be by the students, but there are people driving this. And as a school, we've employed um, two education technologists who will support who are uh, in an ongoing way supporting people and delivering more interactive content and getting their lectures online on making our virtual learning environment more consistent for students. And that's a massive kind of massively positive thing that's also come out of the pandemic as having these people on board to bring our teaching uh, into the next century. And whilst, you know, it was very successful previously in the more conventional teaching sense, being able to embrace some of these new ideas and having people on board and seeing how it can work is again, a really, really positive thing. From the student's point of view, I think, you know, students like online uh, lectures. It's been a challenge to kind of, um, I guess, engage with students to use the material appropriately. Some students are using online lectures, but more like Netflix, where they binge watch, they watch it over and over, they kind of dwell on the small points. So it's a learning curve for them as well in terms of how to best use this new way of delivering content. Now, as we go into the next year, we have a more hybrid approach where there'll be some online teaching uh, and some in-person teaching. So again, we're shifting gear slightly, but I think the skills that students have learned over the past year or so will be putting them in a really strong position to be able to engage material most efficiently um, going forward. Students have missed being in the uh, practical classes. This year, we hope to deliver a lot more hands-on in-person practical sessions. And alongside the online lectures, um, I think this will be a really good package for students. So as we go beyond the pandemic, as I say, you know, the platforms and the things that have been established are going to create a really good basis, a firm foundation for really building on this and developing and implementing more change. So whilst it's been a fairly traumatic experience, um, with the pandemic hitting and having to adapt and having to make all these changes in a really short time frame, I think the long term benefit is going to outweigh that short term pain. And from students point of view, as I say, you know, they're used to doing a lot of their lives online. So bringing teaching online as well, I think is going to be really positive. From an accessibility point of view, thinking about the different educational needs of different students having things online as well as in person and delivering content in new and kind of creative ways, I think is really benefiting students with specific accessibility needs as well. So I think the overall package, I think has been a real plus, as I say, short term pain, but long term gain. And I'm sure, you know, you may have questions at the end of uh, what we have to say. So we'll be happy to uh, elaborate on some of these points if you want to know more. So I will, on that note, hand back to Matthias. Great, thank you, Dee. So my role or focus has been around postgraduate training. And what I'd like to do is, is present just sort of two snippets of projects that we've been working on. And they're both centered around diversity because diversity promotes creativity and excellence. And so the question is really, how do we foster diversity? And so, so there are two projects. The first one that we ran this year, we wanted to run it last year, but, but we couldn't because the pandemic had just kicked off. But this year we said we've got to run it and we did it. We pulled it off. It's a summer internship program that brings in students from widening participation backgrounds into the Cambridge research environment. And the second one kind of follows on from that, which deals with the question of 
then how do we encourage and actually enable students from widening participation backgrounds to then take on postgraduate education? Because that's the route into different professional environments and also into academia, teaching the next generation. So here on the on the right, you see the, the group of 15 students who we selected from over 360 applicants uh, across the UK. Those students, we thought, you know, were the most promising and deserving. They all had overcome a range of difficulties. And there you see them at the end of an intensive, fun, eight-week research internship, having presented their work, which was absolutely stunning. You see them beaming, smiling away. Now, some of these students, that was the first time they were away from home. And for several of these students, their families depended on their income to keep them off the streets or their income to provide caring responsibilities. So it's really, really important that we found an environment where we could host them that was safe and nurturing. And we were really fortunate that Fitzwilliam College, a college with a long history of promoting widening participation and access, offered accommodation to these students free of charge and alongside set up as a mentoring or you know, really a pastoral care program with PhD students and professionals as well. A fantastic opportunity. The income that these students and their families depend on, that was delivered as a working wage. So these students earn money, the real living wage, as if they were on a summer job, which many of them depend on. That's facilitated by major funding from the Wellcome Trust, the BBSRC, and generous donations from the LMB Laboratory and the Department of Genetics. It's been an eight-week internship for these students, each hosted in a lab uh, of their own research interest. And alongside, they had the benefit of a dedicated training program, including anything from sort of computational data analysis to communications to one-to-one uh, -one tailored career sessions, looking forward, say, what is it that they want to do? How do they get there? Now, what I'd like to do is, is play you a little snippet of a, uh, one of the videos that some of these students made. And I could have chosen any one of these, uh, but I thought, thought I, I'd choose this one here where we see Dew. Uh, she was a student that Tim hosted and her colleague Khadija. And here we go. Hi, guys. My name is Dew. Hi, my name is Khadija. So today we're going to be talking about our experiences so far at this Cambridge internship. And then we're going to be giving advice to whoever wants to apply in the future. Kadina, be honest. What is one thing you enjoyed about this experience? There's so many positive things. I think it would just be in general actually getting the lab experience uh, because first year of uni for me was cut short into six months because of the pandemic. So yeah. up in, from March 2020 to August now, I've not physically been in uni. The second year is where you get all your lab experience, especially in a science degree. Yeah. And obviously we missed out on that. Oh my that, God. This is why like this experience was so important for me because what even was a pipette? I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. Um, but coming here like is has been so good because mm. I've actually gotten the experience that I was meant to have. I don't feel like I've missed out on anything. Yeah, high five. Honestly, I can't think of better way to spend my summer. Mm. Because it's a paid internship as well and you're learning experience, so it's the best way you get in education and finances as well. So. Definitely. It's like you're in an intellectually stimulating environment and you're being paid for it. So it's, it's a win-win. It it's is. Win -win. Honestly, whoever wants to apply for this program, honestly, I encourage you to. It was honestly, you meet so many different people. You get to have so many conversations. These are priceless. You don't get to meet these people in your local area. I'm being honest, like mm -hmm. you have to leave your comfort zone. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Get out, get out of the comfort zone because nothing grows in there. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Thank we you. hope you enjoyed the video. Bye. So look at the enthusiasm, look at the fun they're having and the confidence. Now that confidence wasn't there at the beginning. It grew and it was so, you know, such a privilege to, to be part of that and to see that I was, I was deeply touched to, you know, witness the transformation. Now, eight weeks is not going to change a life. Eight weeks is not going to change an un inherent lack of confidence or feeling out of place because you're from a minority, what have you. So that's what we do here is we, this is just a starting point and what we've done over these eight weeks, we've built a mentor relationship both with the uh, 
you know, the scientists, the PIs who hosted these students, but also with current PhD students from the BBSSC Doctoral Training Partnership, who provide a sort of peer-to-peer -peer mentorship to help this in discussion, you know, get these students to the line to apply for master's programs, to apply to PhD programs, to deal with all of the hurdles that get thrown in the way when it comes to changing from an undergraduate to a postgraduate degree. So it's, a, it's been a fantastic opportunity. You see acknowledgements. Uh, one of the people I should have you know, put a, really right across the board here is, is Kath Poutsland. She's the university's winding participation officer for postgraduate education. She's been fantastic at facilitating everything we've been doing. The second thing, very briefly, I'd like to touch on are the master's programs. So in the School of the Biological Sciences, we've organized our research activities into six different themes. And for each of these themes, we're currently in the process of designing new master's student programs. Now, these are, we call them master's programs because, again, they come with dedicated training packages, programs, all the, you know, again, from computational analysis all the way through communications and outreach to, to you know, des experimental design, ethics, you name it. And they allow this cohort experience to select talented students, small cohorts of talented students, and bring them into the research environment so that we have, again, this mixture of peer-to-peer -peer support. Very important here is that these master's courses need to come with the resources to support the students and to support the program itself. And that's what we've established together with the center of the university. We've arrived at a funding model that allows us to fund excellent administration as well as have dedicated bursaries. So there's a brief list here of what these new, new master's programs, we call them MPhil courses, will provide. And it's a very exciting development uh, that other faculties are picking up on as well. And we're collaborating again with the physical sciences and other faculties to see what can we generate across the university in terms of you know, postgraduate training provisions in a way that allows access and in a way that generates creativity and strong, a strong research base. So with that, I'd like to sort of conclude our sort of presentation and invite you as the audience to sort of, you know, for questions and uh, start a discussion. Yeah, wonderful. And I could just echo what Matthias was saying. I watched how Du, who was in the lab, came in very quiet, um, a little intimidated, a little confused the first couple of days. But by two weeks in, she was talking to all the other students in the lab. She was working closely with other students on summer programs. By four weeks in, she was coming up with ideas. She started to do different experiments, things that we hadn't even talked about. And by eight weeks, uh, you know, she was just so excited to have had this chance. Um, when I told her that if she needs anything in the future, drop me a line, happy to give her, you know, have a Zoom chat or, or meet up with her if she comes through Cambridge uh, or write a letter of support. Um, I think she almost broke down crying. She was so excited. She wanted to hug me. It was really quite amazing to see this. Um, and that goes for all of the students. So. Uh, it really was quite, quite a unique opportunity for them, and they really did take full advantage of it. Now, on to questions. Keep them coming in, but I actually want to start off Dee, uh, for you, uh, Dee. Someone wanted to know what, uh, uh, which is a bit of a fun question, what was the most challenging part of, uh, of trying to deliver things online? Uh, was there anything in particular that our colleagues weren't, weren't great at, uh, at adapting to? Okay. <laughs> Some of our colleagues, I think there were challenges from our colleagues where I had many uh, conversations late at night where people hadn't anticipated quite what they needed to do to achieve what they were trying to achieve. And I think there was a lot of fear around just new processes. And I guess people, once they were more confident, that has kind of petered off a bit. But I think our colleagues were fearful of change. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment of it. Um, I would say that uh, it took a little bit of time, but once people actually did the uploading of a lecture once, it was then fairly straightforward. And the university has lots of information. Um, the school, D, was presenting lots of information, but some of our colleagues just, I think, may have ignored it. And uh, as we do as academics, kind of waited to the last minute um, to decide they needed to do something. Um, so yeah, I think that's a very way, good way of putting it. Um, now one for you, Matthias, uh, asking about how we might be able to measure success um, with a program, especially something like a summer program. 
That's a, that's a really good one because it's, it's very easy to do stuff because it makes you feel good. But you know, does that mean it actually works for the person who's attended for? And, and so measuring success is, can be difficult. I think there are some very straightforward measures. Number one, um, we, we may, you know, data is everything. So we've got very integral sort of, you know, questionnaire procedures. So students who join the program, the summer internship, for example, they are given a, a range of questions that we designed together with Cus Pauslins, our widening participation officer, to find out about their attitudes, their fears, their hopes, and, and their, their outlook, particularly uh, and, you know, for us as to how do they consider Cambridge, this university, this place that to, to many people outside looks and feels you know, really strange. And then they are, you know, as they go through, we've got a midterm inch and you're checking in. And then at the end, as they leave, we also check you know, how have these very same attitudes and perspectives changed? And they have changed tremendously. You know, at the start, maybe a quarter of them thought, maybe I decide, you know, I, I might give Cambridge applications a go. By the end, it was three quarters. So that's, that's great. In terms of start to finish, everyone at the end wanted to pursue postgraduate education. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's here or elsewhere, as long as they move, you know, actually you know, use their talent and move on. That's what it's about. The longitudinal, long-term tracking, we will do that through, through, through databases that are in existence like LinkedIn because it's really hard otherwise to keep track of people who pass through an institution, an educational establishment, and then go into the professional world. LinkedIn is, one of, is a good platform that allows us to do that, and we work with partners at University College London who've done so successfully. So we're learning you know, from our colleagues at other universities as we go along. So far, it looks like it's been worth it. Yeah, it's great. We know that the colleges have often had this same question, do a lot of outreach, a lot of widening participation activities, but then how do you actually know those students go on to Russell Group Universities, go on to do research and go forward? And there are ways of tracking this over time. It's a little bit easier though once these students are actually enrolled in a university. And as Matthias said, something like LinkedIn actually does a lot of the work for you as long as you're able to stay in contact with them. Um, and I know also that even students who leave laboratories or leave the university, we're still in contact on a relatively, you know, relatively uh, common basis um, to make sure they're still up to date uh, with anything that's happening. That's great. Um, Dee, we've got a question kind of for you and I looking at uh, online assessment and trying to, one, validate the identity of the individual, and then secondly, how are we able to sort of uh, mitigate any cheating and does online examination increase cheating? So I guess I can answer the first one. Um, we would check IDs in the same way. They can hold it up to a camera and we would verify it's the correct person. Um, but we actually have quite a few measures in place for the upcoming year um, by using a new online platform called Inspira um, and ways of, of defending against any type of uh, misbehavior. And Dee, maybe you could walk us through some of those. Yeah, this has been a really big concern from our colleagues as we do exams online. And of course, we've had to do it in the last 18 months in a very reactive way. Um, and we've learned an enormous amount from that. So as Tim said, one of the things is just simply validating identity. There have been some courses where they have had so-called online proctoring, which means that they basically are having somebody view them and listen to what's going on in the room. Now, going forward with the platform that we've identified, again, we'll have the facility to do uh, online proctoring, which actually views their screen as well as them and the room. Now, the platform that we're looking at, it doesn't have to be a live proctoring thing. It can be, it's called record and review, where people can go back and have a look, particularly if they think, well, they could sample the students to make sure that the integrity of the exam as, is as expected. Using a dedicated platform also means that you can lock down devices so students aren't able to access things inappropriately. But actually, this has raised a lot of discussion in the last 18 months about the value of closed versus open book exams. And prior to the pandemic, we were looking at alternative modes of assessment. And again, this is something that's really accelerated some of these discussions as to are we actually assessing students in the best possible way. And all of these things will feed into how we assess them, and that will determine what steps we need to ensure the integrity of the exam. Now, whilst we're doing this online and we're making assumptions at the moment that students could be in their own room or their own college doing their exam online, of course, ultimately, the goal might be to have students in an exam hall in a more conventional way, but 
having an online platform that is used to facilitate the exam. So I think all of these things are kind of in play and the methods that are being employed are to really ensure the integrity of the exam. Now, the other thing that happens with examinations that are done electronically is all of the scripts are passed through some software called Turnitin, which enables you to identify suspected plagiarism. And if you do suspect plagiarism, you then can follow this up in, in kind of an iterative way that you can determine whether or not there has been some sort of cheating or collusion going on. So lots of steps are in play to try to make the exams as watertight as absolutely possible. Yeah. Thank you, Dee. Um, well, I really can't stress this. It's actually probably a, a much better environment in a way uh, for students. We get a lot of feedback that being in their own rooms or having the option to sit in assessment in the room really does help with anxiety levels for many of the students and helps them to feel comfortable and actually perform at the higher level. And so many of the students gave us feedback that online assessments made them feel as though they were able to actually show what they know and actually get across that information. Um, whereas in the exam hall in front of each other with someone pacing the, you know, around the room, that environment they actually found themselves unable to uh, successfully put down all that information. Now there's another question about exams I think that actually feeds into this a little bit. It's looking at how would you able to run an online exam with mathematical symbols, symbols or formula. And one of the nice things uh, about the platform that we're going to pilot is it actually allows you to write things down and then upload those as a separate document. So um, this also goes in the biological sciences where students are expected to often draw di diagrams or maybe to draw out a pathway or to, to sketch out something that would be really supportive of their essay. And so in a way, we, we are aware that this is a, a critical part of the assessment. And so the platform will allow them to take a picture uh, with their phone or take a picture with the camera and then can upload that directly into the, site, uh, into the system. And that will then naturally fit in uh, to their essay and actually it takes away a lot of the bureaucratic sort of chasing lost scripts or a PDF over there or a Word document over here. In the same way we used to chase around pieces of paper um, throughout the university for a month and a half at a time trying to figure out why there's a, a piece of paper that we've missed from uh, you know, one of the assessments, um, which was quite a bit of stress for everyone. Um, and Dee, yeah, could you maybe elaborate a little more on that one? And I was just going to add to that, not only um, can students upload stuff that they've written down on a piece of paper and put into their script, but there is facility within these platforms to actually uh, do calculations, to write down formulae and so on. So these have been developed with the express purpose of delivering all sorts of ex online exams. And lots of these considerations have been thought about. And um, so there are various different ways of delivering kind of more mathematical examinations. Yeah, and we can tell you that this past year, um, the engineering, uh, School of Engineering, as well as um, uh, physicists and the chemists, they were using a, a different software to proctor the exam, um, but those exams were still being completed by hand. Um, and so there, there's a, certainly a learning curve with it, but we're not the only ones <laughs> trying to, 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 to move forward in this way. And these challenges are being solved by lots of other individuals and, and by keeping conversations going, by talking with people, I have no doubt we'll come up with a, a good way to solve these. Um, actually, a question now for kind of all three of us, but maybe we'll start with you, Matthias. With students now, uh, especially this past year, not being able to get into the research environment and to do a research project hands-on, um, what was offered and, and was it successful? That was, uh, yeah, for example, I mean, I, from my own lab, for example, we had an undergraduate student in the lab who was due to start in the lab, but due to the sort of repeated you know, infections in their household, you know, managed to have one day. And that was, that was, you know, it could have been soul destroying, but it wasn't because we maintained contact and we, you know, redevised projects so that they were much more data driven rather than sort of generating data in experiments. And, you know, whilst making sure that the students take on board, you know, how data are generated, how experiments are designed, conducted, and what the outcomes might be. So it's, it so very much simulates of the, the process of, of re, you know, turning the, the actual physical world 
into a sort of a, a, a virtual one and changing how we teach, how we instruct, and then what it is that we want the students to work with, namely to think about experimental design, the output and the critical analysis of the data and then how they interpret that. So that was, I think, fairly il illustrative of many of the issues that we faced. Now the part two students, uh, so the final year students, um, they ha had sort of a mixed experience depending on how much lab time they, different individuals were able to get. But I got the sense of feedback that all of them came out feeling very well supported. We made sure that there was peer-to-peer -peer interactions that when we have online meetings, we always use facilities such as breakout rooms to, to, to have small group discussions going on rather than you know, the, the, the big blanket you know, uh, com, you know, phase where, where people might feel a little shy in, in chipping in. Absolutely. Um, Dee, did you want to add anything? I know there were more sort of online um, only type projects that were put forward and actually students I think even this year are going to have the opportunity, if they so choose, to do a more bioinformatics or more of a, a modeling style project that you wouldn't necessarily have to be in a wet lab all day. Um, but was, was it successful in biochemistry for the most part? I, I think it was. I mean, there were different issues faced by the part two, so third and fourth year students, uh, so part two and three, who had lab-based projects normally. There was a lot more bioinformatics done. And I think you know, there's lots of interest in these areas anyway. So I think they weren't kind of dumbed down projects. They were very, the students got a lot out of the projects. In the part one teaching, so first and second year students who are normally in a more teaching lab with a more structured lab. As I said earlier, you know, we were able to use software we, where we could deliver as close to possible as the real thing. And I think some of the students possibly got more out of it than actually being in the lab. I mean, there's no doubt they missed the lab experience, but they learned an awful lot because we took them through the, through the kind of steps in a way that they would normally do in the lab. You know, we looked at experimental design and that was a really fundamental part of what we delivered. The other thing we were able to do was actually to send out kits of uh, equipment, we sent out pipettes, we sent out um, tasks that they could do in their college setting. And this was incredibly popular with the students as well. So a bit of creative thought meant that students could get their hands on pipettes, they could do something practical, they would send in their data and we were able to um, kind of collate that as a class and then do some statistical analyses on that. And so I think, well, while it was far from perfect, I think that actually it was a really good experience that the students had. And most of them really enjoyed those kind of interactive sessions that took place. Yeah, thank you, Dee. Um, and I can echo both of what was said. That was absolutely the case in, in my experience. Um, we have a couple of questions asking about how much student engagement uh, and where the, the focus is, I think maybe uh, unintentionally, we've been talking about it from sort of our side as lecturers, but I just want to take a second just to explain how we brought students along on all of these different aspects, not only of online uh, education or assessment or of restructuring a uh, course. So a lot of what came out of the, the desire to stay online um, obviously was out of necessity at the beginning, but we have regular conversations with students. So there's student representation on all of the major committees and all of the minor committees. All of the individual course committees have multiple student representatives. So in a larger course, like a first year course, we might rotate through 10 to 12 different student representatives. And they will give us constant feedback at the end of each term. But really importantly, at these management meetings for each of our courses at the end of the academic year, they give us feedback about what they thought worked in the course, how the assessment went, how the delivery of the lectures and the practicals was, was done. And what we realized was a lot of students did, and not everyone, but many of them did prefer these online assessments, not only because they could type, there was a little more flexibility, um, they actually felt like they were more comfortable in front of a computer rather than, as we said, an exam hall. And building off of sort of that initiative, we then went forward, talked to our colleagues, talked to more students, and then decided this was something that was worth exploring. So I apologize earlier if it wasn't clear, all of these things in a way have been student driven from the student representatives feeding back to the course organizers who then um, sort of from the ground up have led us to then explore it in the position that we're in um, and then hopefully be able to fund and deliver it. Um, yes, Dee, please. 
uh, just to add to that, I mean, a slightly kind of um, odd thing. I mean, to the point we listened to student feedback, students were very vocal about telling us what they thought they needed and what would be best for them. And this was not just in the School of Biological Sciences, this was across the university. And one of the things that happened last year was a lengthened exam period with open book exams. And a lot of staff were very concerned about this in terms of the implications for students working too many hours, their mental health and so on. And actually students came to realize themselves after that exam period that it wasn't the best way to do things. So that communication between the staff and students was really important. The students did actually in that instance get what they thought they wanted, but came to realize that it actually wasn't the best decision. So it's been a really um, interesting process, not just for staff, but also for students. I think also just moving away from sort of the memorization of, of information and then the emptying of that information onto a page, we're really now trying to come up with diversity of assessment and also asking questions that force students to think, um, especially in the final year. You know, and this also goes back to the idea of cheating. There really isn't an answer <laughs> per se, right? You have to come up with an argument, support it with evidence. There's nothing that's going to be, uh, you know, you can cut and paste over from the notes anymore um, in those third and fourth years. Uh, and so I, I would just reiter reiterate that this is a learning process from both sides. And there's certain, a ton of communication, not only between the students and the lecturers, students and students, and uh, lecturers and lecturers, uh, which has been really quite, quite powerful. Um, we did have a couple of other questions that I'll, I'll try to race through here. So one was thinking about face-to-face -face teaching versus online. Are there things that are better online? And how can we maintain some of those um, really good things that we've noticed from online teaching? So I know, Dee, if there's anything that jumps to mind um, offhand for you that, that we would be able to maintain. I think some of the um, sessions where we were having kind of Q&A sessions after other either in-person or online events were really positive. Like I said earlier, for some students, that was a much better platform than actually, um, well, being present, I guess. They could ask their questions in a more anonymous way. So I think potentially they got more out of that learning experience. Um, so I think that was good. I think it also brought the opportunity for students to come along to sessions that they might not have had time to do otherwise. And I think of some of the more voluntary kind of sessions where they would still come along. So I think having that possibility of doing hybrid teaching or online teaching exclusively actually brings opportunities that we didn't have previously. I can't think of anything more specific off the top of my head, but I think there is a place where we retain some of that uh, online kind of platform. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think it feeds in the what you so brought up that that for for those who are sort of neurodivergent, again, the, having the time to process information before then going into a question and answer session is incredibly helpful. So it, again, it, it opens up, you know, the the opportunities for, to a group of students that otherwise might be sort of falling behind. Yeah, D. Yeah, and and just to add to that, you know, we realised after the first few weeks of um, Michaelmas term last year, that actually there was a massive pressure from students to release lectures ahead of the scheduled slot. And whilst it was useful to maintain that scheduled slot because you could have uh, question and answer sessions appropriately, having a longer period of time for the students to engage in the materials so or having that 20 hours, again, provided much more diversity for students with different needs and they could watch it and you know, uh, gain more potentially from the lecture and be ready to be in a place. To yeah, it. wonderful. Um, there was one other question sort of about uh, students and how they were able to adapt to the new atmosphere and the new environment and also just their well-being in general. And I would just highlight that a lot of this was a learning curve for everyone, but a lot of students did start to kind of come up with a way that might work for them. The isolation was a problem, and I do think um, having households within colleges helped but we're really keen on seeing the students coming together. Maybe perhaps that could be outdoors or in larger spaces so that they do get that cohort building experience. I know next week, uh, at least in the college I'm at, the first year students are going to be taken out to lunch by the second year students. And it's things like this that I think the, the students that are a little bit older know what it was like to come here and not have much interaction. And now they're really gonna work hard um, to help out those younger, the younger year. 
The other thing is we are really optimistic, but it looks like things like choir and sports and debate and comedy and theater, all of these will be back in some proportion this year, which will make the university you know, the thriving and exciting place that it always is. And, and there's uh, you know, no measure to say how much better that will be for all of the students as they kind of have these other experiences and things to do. Um, and I think I'll hand it over to Matthias for maybe a final word. <laughs> well, it's really a word of, of thanks. Uh, thanks to you know, you know, both you, Tim, and Dee for, for being here today. Thanks to the colleagues at the school and our head of school, Anna Philpo, with, with her sort of boundless enthusiasm and optimism. And thanks to the festival team for this opportunity. Thank you, the audience, for engaging here for your questions. They make us think. Keep them coming because we'd like to sort of, you know, develop this as best we can.